welcome to another episode of Becoming a Techno Wizard. And today we continue our series on Hegel. But I just realized I didn't change my title. Oh my gosh. Whoops. Whoopsie. Let me do that now. I'm gonna have to do this live because if I restart, I guess I could I could I could just restart. Um but I'm gonna do it now anyways. Let's see if it breaks anything. I've never done this live. And in my title, part 23. Um, sections, we're gonna be going over sections 52 and 53, I think. Yes. Okay. Let's learn about Hegel. Then I need to link to the original video. So last section, Sections 52 and 50, I'm sorry, 51 and 50, no, 50 and 51, right? We talked about um, Oh, I, I'm not sure if it, if it changed. I think so. Hopefully. <laughs> Last section we talked about um, he, how Hegel was just throwing shots, right, at math. Now, let me see what I wrote last time. I said <laughs> Hegel throws shots and drops bars in this sizzling section where he uses some cutting humor to poke fun at how certain philosophers, and really most people, tend to use analogies and formulaic intu intu intuitions to describe the world. When you use a set schema for everything, it's like painting with two colors, where one color is for the landscape and the other for all the people. <laughs> Hegel makes it clear that being formulaic and reductive is, is a no-go if you want to do philosophy. Dr. Sadler also emphasizes how Hegel uses humor to showcase the presumptuous nature of his forebears, and though he may be bit biting and satirical, that does not mean he is being arrogant. It's just facts that formulism is deeply problematic and ridiculous, right? So all those people who reduce Hegel himself down to, you know, this triadic dude who's like, you know, synthesis and antithesis and, you know, um, reunion or whatever. <laughs> I, forget the, <laughs> I forget every time. Uh, those people are wrong, right? That's not what Hegel is about. So before I continue, let's see. Dr. Sattler, he described the last section as follows. He said, in this section, Hegel dis discusses whether employing the triadic form is enough for the dialectical approach he will develop in the phenomenology. While it can be quite powerful, when it is turned into a mere schema, it gives merely an appearance of science, but does not embody its labor and reality. He criticizes the formalism of, the sort of, of this sort of philosophy, a philosophy of the understanding, and towards the end of section 51, sets out a brilliant painting metaphor satirizing those kinds of superficial approaches once again yeah when it's you know, two colors when one so yeah it, it was really fantastic um i really loved that section he was, was just dropping bars for real so um let's get started with this next section 52 and 53 wow. Oh, gosh. The excellent, however, not only cannot escape the fate of being thus deprived of life and spirit, of being flayed and then seeing its skin wrapped around a lifeless knowledge mm. in its conceit. So, yeah, already dropping bars. This is what I love about Hegel, right? He's so descriptive and, like, visual with it. Like, if this, I'm telling you, man, if he was an artist, if he was a rap artist today, man, he'd be going ham. We're going crazy. He says, the excellent, however, not only can I escape the fate of being thus deprived of life and spirit, of being flayed and then seeing its skin wrapped around a lifeless knowledge and its conceit. You know, it sounds like a freaking Elden Ring character. Like, <laughs> this is, <laughs> you know, really, really uh, just dark kind of situation to be a flaying and wrapping the skin around like this. Is, it gives you a very grim metaphor. Um, of what he's talking about. He, he has really a big distaste for uh, what these people do with this, with, with like wrapping around, wrapping science with these, you know, fake intuitions and things like that. Flayed and it. then seeing its skin wrapped around a lifeless knowledge and its conceit. 
Rather, we recognize, even in this faith, the power that the excellent exercises over the hearts, if not over the minds of men. Hmm. Also, the constructive unfolding into universality and determinateness of form, in which its perfection consists and which alone makes it possible for this universality to be used in a superficial way. All right. Beautiful. I mean, you, you got to call these people out, you know, but bring Section 52. Because you see that still to this day, you see way, you probably see even more of that today. That's kind of the um, downside of having so many more people that's, that's educated is that you also have so many people that's fake educated or that think they're incredibly smart when they're really not. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, right? Because it's going to happen whether or not you have a democratization of education or not, you know, um, like it's because of the democratization of education that I'm able to do something like this and learn about Hegel myself, even though I've never been to college. So I definitely welcome it. But, you know, you gotta, you gotta call these people out, you know, you gotta call these people out. Um, and hopefully people hear this and be like, Okay, maybe maybe I shouldn't just pretend that I know Hegel, even though I don't, you know, because because then I, I might be kidding myself to a a, 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 a wrapping a flayed skin wrapped around the <laughs> conceit, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's good good stuff to to uh, call out. Two is very short, just a few lines. But in it, Hegel is sort of bringing to a close some of the reflections in the much longer section that preceded it. And he's talking here about how it is that what's, what's getting translated as the excellent, the fortreiflicher, that which stands out. What does he mean by that? The dialectical process, the development of spirit, everything that's getting, you know, further and further along in the process and our understanding of that as well. There's a risk for this, and we just talked about that before, even in the you know, famous Hegel triadic schema, there's a risk even in that of it becoming purely schematic, mm -hmm. of becoming, as he's going to say, superficial. So what he says is that the fate of the excellent in this case, and the excellent could be whatever it is that we, we happen to be devoting our attention to. It could be the holy, it could be the beautiful, it could be reason, you know, intruding into institutions through history, it could be the development of family dynamics, you know. Um, any of these sorts of things can be deprived of life and spirit. And he uses the German ent, you know, constructions, you know, they're entgeistet. They, they literally are having spirits stripped away from them or distanced from them. They're, imagine that they're being put here in our consideration while the process is still going on and the real stuff is happening over there and we're looking at the digested form. Thing. Mm. So they can be deprived of life and spirit. Interestingly, and Hegel is noting something that's, that's very important here, particularly for the practice of philosophy, it still has power, that whatever it is that we're calling the excellent here, still has power over hearts, gemüter. He doesn't say Herzen, he says gemüter, meaning sort of our affective centers, mm. uh, where we have our sentiments, but not over minds. There's a lot of cases where people will get into a philosophical system and now they see the world that way but their commitment to it is really more emotional or a matter of their desires a matter of their their interests in the sense of you know they are interested participants uh, it is is benefiting them in some way mm. rather than being called in by the colder and starker demands of truth hmm. which is what Hegel would say you know Geist mind spirit is sooner or later going to have to tackle. That's the force of the negative there. Um, he finishes by, by talking in this, this rather <laughs> turgid sentence about how developed, unfolded universality can be used in superficial ways. He's calling our attention to a risk that he's just talked about earlier in the section before that as being something like, uh, you know, turning 
Hegel's, you know, account of the development of spirit through all these different gestalt and all these different stages of consciousness into something like um, all the jars, and this is not exactly the metaphor, all the jars full of different stuffs at the general store mm. or going into the hardware store and, you know, pulling open all the drawers and there's that kind of screw, there's that kind of screw. It's organized. You can find stuff when you need it. Um, you can use it to do some sort of extrinsic project of your own, but the dynamism, the connection, the intrinsic development has actually been lost, and so any use of it is going to be superficial. It's, it's sort of taking over what was, you know, won through very difficult and laborious uh, centuries-old, decades-old work and culminating in the, the synoptic view of it that Hegel has. Right. And then turning it into greeting cards, turning it into memes, turning it into schemas that you can easily plop things into. That's what he wants to caution us against. Uh, the next section, he's moving away from that. So this is kind of a culmination and linchpin section. Nice, nice. Let's get into it. And I, I've got to say, I really like how, you know, Dr. Seller br brings in the German, the German words um, and recognizes that or sh helps us see, you know, the difference in how they use the words in terms of like the context. Um, Cause that is something that people often say is like, I was like, I was reading something earlier today about uh, design and how, you know, people, some people are like, Oh, don't use, don't use um, buzzwords or like, you know, uh, jargon, right. They call it jargon, um, which is a little bit different than buzzwords. Okay, so don't use jargon, and when you're talking about design, these in these in these uh, conferences or whatever. But like, what like what else are you supposed to use? <laughs> you know, if you're going to a conference about design, you need to be using the quote unquote jargon, right? That's the language that people are speaking um, in order to really communicate the ideas. If you try to change it and simplify it, you lose a lot of the you know the depth and the the, the context, right? It becomes uh, like a, what, what kind of Hegel is saying here is superficial, and um, and I think the same could be done could be said for philosophy or for anything written in other languages. Is that those other languages have different ways of thinking and and things like that. So uh, we are losing something, right? When we're listening, when we're reading or listening, whatever, in a different language, in a translated language. So I really appreciate you know Dr. Sally here for for doing that for. You know, pointing out these these different contexts because, again, it's it's very easy to lose, and it provides some it adds some of it back. Maybe not all of it, obviously not all of it, but it adds some of it back. So, it's it's nice. Good stuff. Science dare only organize itself by the life of the notion itself, the determinateness which is taken from the schema and externally attached to an existent thing is in science, the self moving soul of the realized content. Mm. The movement of a being that it immediately is consists partly in becoming an other than itself and thus becoming its own imminent content, partly in taking back into itself this unfolding of its content or this existence of it, that is in making itself into a moment mm. and simplifying itself into something determinate. In the former movement, negativity is the differentiating and positive all right, so let me go back because I think I'm I'm getting what he's saying here. He says the movement of a being that immediately is consists partly in becoming an other than itself and thus becoming its own mimic content. All right, so you have like this threat of um trying to understand something for what is not, you know, you can kind of mis misalign it or you can misdefine it, mis misunderstand it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this was a typo or something. Is that an actual word? Im Im imminent? I guess it's different than eminent. Meaning it's indwelling, inherent. Okay. Theory of imminent, so is that the divine? Existing or remaining within itself. All right, all right. Divine encompasses or is manifested in the material world. Divine presence. Okay, interesting. 
never would have thought that was a thing. <laughs> um, kind of becoming its own MMA content. So it's like becomes like its own essentialism, I guess. I like a, it's like defining itself, <laughs> which is weird. Uh, partly taking back into itself this unfolding of its content or this existence of it, i.e. in making itself into a moment and simplifying itself into something determinate. So as you're trying to, you know, understand it again, if you're trying to unfold, you know, unwrap, like unravel this idea with its content. Um, hmm. This existence of it and making itself into a moment and simplifying itself into something determinate. Yeah. As, I guess you're, as you're trying to unwrap it, as you're trying to, you know, understand this thing, you simplify it, open it up, and make it like turn like solid, right? Interesting. In the former movement, negativity is the differentiating and positiving of existence. In this return into self, it is the becoming of the determinate simplicity. It is in this way that the content shows that its determinateness is not received from something else, nor externally attached to it, but that it determines itself and ranges itself as a moment having its own place in the whole. The understanding in its pigeonholing process keeps the necessity and notion of the content to itself. All that constitutes the concreteness, the actuality, the living movement of the reality which it arranges. Or rather, it does not keep this to itself, since it does not recognize it. For if it had this insight, it would surely give some sign of it. Mm. It does not even recognize the need for it. Else it would drop its schematizing, or at least realize that it can never hope to learn more in this fashion than one can learn from a table of contents. <laughs> A table of contents is all that it offers. The content itself, it does not offer at all. Mm. Even when the specific determinateness, say one like magnetism, for example, is in itself concrete or real, the understanding degrades it into something lifeless, merely predicating it of another existent thing, rather than cognizing it as the imminent life of the thing, or cognizing its native and unique way of generating and expressing itself in that thing. Mm. The formal understanding leaves it to others to add this principal feature. Instead of entering into the imminent content of the thing, it is forever surveying the whole and standing above the particular existence of which it is speaking. That is, it does not see it at all. Hmm. So oh, it's a long section. All right. So I was slightly off base in the beginning. I thought he was moving on to like uh, the other, like how you break down these ideas, but he's... He's still on like what he was talking about before, right? It's like when you intuit things and try to understand or try to claim you understand it um, on an intuitive level, right? You kind of simplify it and you make it like specific and determinate, solid. But at the same time, and so doing, um, he says here, where is it? The table of contents thing, right? And so doing, you 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 kind of turn it into a kind of um, a, dis a, a surface level description of itself, which is like a table of contents, right? It's a, it's showing you what the content, wh where the content is, but it's not actually describing that content, right? It's it's or it's, it's not really you know going into depth about it right then and there. So by doing so, with this surface level you know understanding, quote unquote understanding. Um, you're not actually understanding anything. You might have the uh, general direction, understand of like what's being covered here, but you're not really getting into details. You're not really uh, uh, learning about the, the the depth of what you're trying to learn or say or um, conceive of, or I guess he he says a uh, cognate, like the cognition. Yeah existence of which it is speaking. That is, it does not see it at all. Cognizing, Scientific right. cognition, on the contrary, demands surrender to the life of the object, or what amounts to the same thing, confronting and expressing its inner necessity. Mm. 
Thus, absorbed in its object, scientific cognition forgets about that general survey, which is merely the reflection of the cognitive process away from the content and back into itself. Yet, immersed in the material and advancing with its movement, scientific cognition does come back to itself, but not before its filling or content is taken back into itself, is simplified into a determinateness, and has reduced itself to one aspect of, ex of its ex own existence, and passed over into its higher truth. Through this process, the simple self-surveying whole itself emerges from the wealth in which its reflection seemed to be lost. Mm. Let's break that down. That was great. Section 53 is a long and rather involved section. I've got a sort of <laughs> schema up here on the board. Hopefully it's not a schematic schema because we're going to be talking about schematism in this, right? But it's supposed to give you some way of, of conceptualizing the various movements and connections that, that Hegel's talking about in here. I don't have everything that he says up on there um, because it would be rather difficult to represent. <laughs> but one thing that we ought to keep in mind when approaching this section is that Hegel is talking about two different things very explicitly. Well, really three different things. One of them is the contrast between scientific cognition and the, the workings of the understanding. When Hegel is criticizing the understanding, he's not saying that something like the Kantian understanding, which has its own categories, that, you know, are, are sort of, you know, posted onto or imposed upon the phenomena so that we can make sense of them, that there's anything really wrong with that. Um, nor is it a criticism of Lockean understanding. You know, the, the understanding was used by a lot of different philosophers. The intellect is another way to translate it. What he's criticizing is a static view of the development of, of human knowledge that doesn't take into account the sort of reflexive position of the knower involved in this. And the fact that categories of the understanding really do, in fact, get generated through these, these processes. It's not as if they're all there and then, boom, we put them there. Because um, then we could, in fact, just have a table of contents that we transpose onto everything, or mm -hmm. grid work. So that's one point. Another thing that he's really focusing on, that's, that's what I've got over here, is the nature of real, concrete, determinate things. How do they get to be that way? How do they move from being okay, speed them into up. alterity from self and then reappropriate that back into themselves? Hegel thinks this is going on for anything that's actually worth studying. So this is, you know, sort of a way to, to capture, to think through the dynamism inherent in things that it gets lost from the perspective of the understanding. Mm -hmm. The other thing is he's trying to think about how should we understand um, the larger whole. Science is systematic, and one of the things that's attractive about the understanding is it does appear to be presenting things in a uniform, systematic way. The trouble is that it flattens everything out and places it into these boxes or schemas or pigeonholes, however you want to think of it, and doesn't really get to what's actually going on in, in the phenomenon. So all three of these are coming together in this particular... Sorry, uh, I did have to speed it up, because like, I, I get distracted a lot very easily. I might have like a low-key ADHD. Like I was thinking about his tie and all this other stuff, and it got me off thinking... That. So yeah, sometimes th this is why I speed it up. Um, not because it's, like, it's boring or anything like that. It's just if I, you know... Not my mind is not completely focused on this, and I'm going to be like distracted and thinking about all these other things. So, um, speeding it up helps me concentrate fully on what he's saying here. Their paragraph, there's another thing in the background, which is that we, we want to be thinking about the status of the knowing or thinking or acting subject, the one who's actually doing philosophy, the one who's actually adopting the scientific perspective on things, the one who has an understanding but is going beyond the mere schematism of, of the understanding, the one who is trying to make sense of the greater whole in which they themselves are a moment. And this can also apply to the, the, the human being who is doing the knowing of another being. Mm. So all that said, um, that's quite a few presuppositions to, to keep in mind. So he talks about, um, let's start here. It says, the movement of a being that immediately is. And the immediately there is, has been sort of read into it. Um, the German is Zeyende. Um, so what that means is a being, something that actually exists, something that is, something that can be run into or, or you know, experienced in one way or another. And the being of such a being, the movement, 
involved in such a being consists, in, he says, partly in becoming an other than itself. Mm. So we've, we've seen this, you know, at many points already discussed. Nothing is as simple as it appears uh, in, in the past. Philosophers wanted to try to boil everything down to the, the simplest stuff. They might have a monism where they think it's something simple that then becomes complex through differentiation. They may be pluralist in that they think there's a whole bunch of substances out there that are ultimately simple and we can't say much about them, but maybe they're mm. qualities. Um, you think of Locke as, as being along those sorts of lines. Hegel is saying nothing is simple. Nothing that actually matters is simple. It's already got within it this tendency to produce something other than itself. And mm. Hegel says, um, this, by doing this, it becomes its own imminent content. So that means that it, it, for this being, the otherness is a way in which this being can come to, in whatever mode it has available for it to do this, get to know itself. Mm. You know, if we want to take a human being, I think it's easier when we look at large scale sorts of things, uh, a human being thinks they know who they are. We have a, a sense of self-identity, right? And then um, we reflect upon ourselves and if we're really being honest with ourselves, we come up with things that are incongruous, that don't actually fit into what we started with. Right. And we say, well, that, that's not me, but actually that is me. And how is that me and not me at the same time? <laughs> I guess, and this is why I put the dotted line here, I guess it really is me, and I wasn't quite what I thought that I was. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can see something like this going on in, for example, um, the famous discussion of the faculties or parts of the soul in Republic Book 4, where Plato is having Socrates lead these young men through a discussion and says, you know, like, is, a, is a soul just one thing? Or does it have you know, different parts or faculties or operations? Um, how would we know that? Hmm. Well, you know, we look for, for conflicts. Are there ever cases? Yeah, this is funny. He's taking, the, you know, this metaphor from philosophy or this story from philosophy. But for me, I just thought about, like, you know, everyday life. Like, when you're growing up, um, going to school or, or learning new things or doing your first job or, you know, having your first, you know, experience with, with a significant other, things like that. All these things, all these moments, you discover things about yourself that you never, you know, knew. That you, you thought you knew yourself, especially as a kid, as a, as a teenager or whatever. You think you're so confident. You know who you are. You know who you're trying to be. And then you just discover so you, you, you're faced with something. You're like, whoa, this isn't me. Like, you have this realization, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm trying to, maybe I'm trying too hard to be like my friends or trying too hard to be look cool or trying too hard to do this. Or, you know, um, you know, like in, in some cases, you know, you, you realize that you're, what you thought were so important. Like for me, I, I thought I really wanted to be, you know, rich. I really wanted to, I thought I really wanted to have all this money and, 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 and all this material success. And then, you know, when I got some of it or, and, and when I met other people that have it, I was like, that's, it's not really what's the, what, what it's about. You know, it's kind of, it feels empty. It doesn't really, you know, fulfill what you thought it was. And so you learn about yourself by seeing what you're not. At the same time, you reintegrate it back into yourself, right? So I realized I didn't want to be, you know, successful or right. Like, mon I didn't really care about being rich, but I did want to make a huge impact still. Like, I still wanted to, like, not necessarily make a company, but I, I want to have, like, a large organization that does a lot of things, right? Um, like, I, 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 so it's, it's like you discover who you are from what you're not. You reintegrate what you, what, you know, what what aspects of it that you um, resonate with, I suppose. Um, and, and in doing so, you kind of understand more about yourself. And so it's so interesting that you see the same thing, you know, with philosophy, with these philosophical ideas. And, and I guess that's the point, right? That, that is the phenomenology. That, that's the experience of being conscious, of being alive um, as a sentient creature, is that you can do all these things. You can have these, these, uh, schisms and um what's the word i'm looking for kind of conflictions not not quite the word i'm looking for but you get the point right you can have these things that are that are uh different but at the same time the same and all this other stuff it's it's a uh, very interesting it's very very cool cases we know that we desire things uh we desire a whole bunch of different things so we have appetites maybe they're all really the same thing maybe it's just one big kind of desire or excess appetite epithumia who knows is there anything that, that resists that? Is there anything that's, in this case, other than that? Mm -hmm. Rationality. Even if we were like pure, straight out hedonists, or people who said that really it's all about desire, um, there wouldn't need, still need to be some sort of reasoning faculty or process that says, yeah, you know, let's do this desire, but not that desire, because they conflict with each other. Or it thinks out, how can I get my, how can I have my cake and eat it too, as the proverb goes? Um, that would already be producing a kind of alterity there, something new, something additional. Um, 
following out this example, so the soul starts out as being something primarily desirous, then it also has something else that is also the soul, and then there's a process of taking it back. So it's been able to, by becoming more complex, adopt a position upon itself. It can be reflexive. Now, um, this is partly taking back into itself this unfolding of its content or this existence of it. That is making itself into a moment. This entire process here is how a thing makes itself a moment within larger holes, within environments, within mm -hmm. Things where situations where there's going to be another kind of alterity, not just an alterity within itself, but the alterity of other moments. So he says, um, in the former movement, that is, in the becoming other, negativity is the differentiating and positing of existence. So again, let's go back to the Plato and, and Soul example. We realize that there's something else there, mm -hmm. and you know, Hegel's not very good at bringing this out right here, but we we grasp things oftentimes through contrast. We intensify right. the outlines of something by having something else that's not it next to it. And so that's part of what's going on here. The original thing that gets, gets things started becomes more determinate, mm -hmm. stands out more. So does this other part that actually turns out to be something within it. It's all part of one big, larger, complex dynamism of, of its own. And so he says, um, that's negativity. And then this returning to itself is the becoming of uh, determinate simplicity. The mm -hmm. becoming of determinacy. How it becomes a determinate, concrete, being by having this, this activity going on within itself. This is a metaphysical description of how things actually are, as opposed to the appearance, which says, you know, things are just what they are. You know, this is not a good example, but this piece of chalk is just a piece of chalk. <laughs> you know, I, I don't really want to do a Hegelian analysis of piece of chalk because I think it's <laughs> really boring, but we can say that about all sorts of other things as well. So he says, um, it's in this way the content shows that its determinateness is not received from anything else. That's a very important point. A lot of people want to say that, that Hegel is all about you know, system and things only have their meaning within the system as one moment in relation to other moments, so they don't really have any meaning or value or you know, persistence or agency of their own. Here, he's saying, no, there, it, it does matter how beings, Zayinda, Zayinden, actually, encounter each other and engage with each other and interact with each other in terms of larger compositions, mm. but as themselves, they already have this dynamic and this, this you know, development of otherness, of negativity within themselves, and the process of taking it back. There's already this this process going on mm -hmm. within them, re, you know, outside of their relations with other things. So the relations with other things could enter into that. They will do that as we get into other parts of the phenomenology. But here, he really wants to stress this point. So he says, um, the understanding and its pigeonholing process does something wrong. It keeps the necessity and the notion, the regret, the concept, right. to itself which is what, what gives the thing determinacy. There's an internal necessity outside of the thing unconnected, at least at this level, to the other necessities that could be governing or ruling or arranging or ordering this whole. He says, um, the understanding tries to keep the necessity and notion of the content to itself. Everything that constitutes the concreteness, the actuality, the living movement of the reality, which it arranges. And again, a different notion of necessity than what many other philosophers are dealing with. Uh, many philosophers would say there, there is no necessity when it comes to things that change. Uh, or things that are not universals. Mm -hmm. Only you know when we get to the realm of particulars, there it's all contingency. Causes do come to, into play, but there, there, there's no internal necessity that governs everything. It's only when we like you know abstract that we can find necessity. Hegel is saying something very different. He's willing to say, yeah, there, there's that kind of necessity. That's that's true. You know, um, not going to rule that out. But there's also a necessity that's involved within the very life of a self-moving thing, within the existence of something that is actual and concrete. Mm. Um, it's quite a brilliant thought there. So he says, the understanding tries to keep this to itself, or rather it does not keep it to itself, why not? Because it doesn't recognize it in the first place. <laughs> Those who are, you, who are relying on philosophies of the understanding, when they encounter Hegelian dialectics, they will say, well this just doesn't make any sense, you know, um, he's, he's, he's saying all these things and it just seems kind of arbitrary, well, that's because they've adopted this point of view as the way things must be, and they never actually entered into the Hegelian point of view. Mm. And when it comes to phenomena that Hegel wants to investigate, they don't actually look for necessity within the phenomena, because it's not going to be there anyway, because obviously it's, you know, it's a particular. <laughs> and they don't grasp the concept. They don't grasp it as a self-developing entity. So he says, um, all it can offer is a table of contents. The content, it does not offer at all. Very nice line there. Mm -hmm. So then he says, look, we'll use an example like magnetism. Even when the specific determinateness is itself concrete or real, the understanding degrades it into something lifeless, merely predicating it of another existent thing, rather than cognizing it as the imminent life of the thing, or cognizing its native and unique way of generating and expressing itself in the thing. So mm -hmm. 
This is not really the best example. Hegel is actually not at his best in dealing with purely physical phenomena, <laughs> but let's go with him on this anyway. So we say, this is magnetic, or iron operates according to, to magnetism, uh, aluminum doesn't, right? What we're doing is we're predicating. And the understanding is really good at doing this sort of thing. X is Y, A is B. A falls into the class of things that are B. It's good at doing that, and we have a whole logic developed for dealing with, with you know, that sort of stuff. If you've actually got some input, you can process it, you can come up with some conclusions. That's all nice. That's not, you know, worthless. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of activities, lots of fields in which that's really great stuff. But it doesn't get at what the thing actually is. Mm -hmm. It's made assumptions. Rather than, and, and those assumptions, the researchers who carry that work out in the first place, they might have actually done the sort of process of delving into the thing and figuring out its guts and its workings, uh, but then it gets put in textbook form, and then people talk about it, and then people manipulate it, sort of like a, a counter, like uh, that famous, you know, blank coin that's exchanged beyond, be, between people without saying anything. I think that's from a Mahler May mm -hmm. uh, poem. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's our toll. Um, in any case, he says, um, the formal understanding leads it to others to add this principal feature, that is, of actually understanding it. Instead of entering into the imminent content of the thing, which is this, it forever surveys the whole and stands above the particular existence of which it is speaking. That is, it does not see it, Hegel says, does not see it at all. It sees the particular only as particular as opposed to the universal about which we can actually have knowledge, real knowledge. And Hegel's saying, no, real knowledge also has to encompass the workings of real things. And those mm -hmm. are particular, sometimes those are individual. Mm -hmm. So he says, um, what does scientific cognition do instead? Demands surrender to the life of the object. This makes perfect sense. If you want to understand, for example, uh, here, here's an example from my, my own past. Um, when I first got into graduate school in philosophy, I was going to do philosophy of language. And the reason why I was going to do philosophy of language is because I had a real interest in, in foreign languages. So, um, you know, French was a semi-foreign language to me because my, my mother spoke French with me at home when I was a kid, but, you know, not, not an awful lot. So I learned French, learned a bit of Mandarin, never very much, but, you know, practiced it with Chinese friends and students, learned German so I could, you know, read stuff like Hegel. Uh, by the time that I was there, I was already working my way through Latin and soon to go into Greek. And I had an interest in, in languages as languages. So I wanted to do philosophy of language as a philosophical examination of what the hell is going on with this stuff that we call language. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked to find that a lot of the people in the field didn't actually know or evince much interest in foreign languages. <laughs> because, you know, they, well, you know, they're just going to generalize about, about things. So they read some Wittgenstein. But we're not even going to read Wittgenstein in German. Even though it's available. You can get facing page copies, just in case your, your German isn't good and you want to consult the English. <laughs> and it really clicked for me when I was reading Ferdinand de Saussure's uh, course in general linguistics. And kind of funny, we were doing a reading group, and I had the, you know, French, Cour, and my friend had the very poorly translated version. Um, and we only got through, like, a couple pages because he was saying, so Saussure is saying this, and I'd say, He's not saying that at all. Here's what he's actually saying. Here's how I would translate that. Um, but one of the things that Saussure said was, well, if you want to be a linguist, if you want to actually study languages, I think that you probably ought to actually study languages and not linguistics first. Learn some languages so you actually have some things to compare. Before you get to the theoretical work of, of trying to figure out you know, the way languages work, you need to actually have some exposure to the objects. You need to enter it into, as Hegel says, surrender to the life of the object. Um, I wouldn't want to talk to a, a fish biologist who learned everything merely by... Uh, looking at textbooks and studies, I would want somebody who's probably actually gone fishing from time to time <laughs> and who has been out there on, on the lakes and perhaps even on the oceans and handled fish in their hands and, and spent time being curious about them and looking at them and saying, oh, this is a strange thing. Yeah. <laughs> I would want somebody who, as most as they, they possibly could, would want to swim with the fishes. Mm -hmm. And it's that way for, for any other phenomena that we want to study. Um, one of the dangers that comes with this is, you know, the, the attraction of the, the, the understanding approach is, well, it's very objective. But it's also detached from the reality that it's supposed to be investigating. Mm -hmm. Does this lapse into pure subjectivism? Um, that's, a, that's a danger. Um, but it's a danger that can come up within the very system itself and be handled by the system uh, by saying, well, let's actually think our way through this. Right. So he says, absorbed in its object, scientific cognition forgets about that general survey. There's this over here, which is merely the reflection of the cognitive process away from the content and back into itself. What's going on with the understanding? The understanding approach is more about surveying the human mind and the way that it's organized and then turning to whatever the mind is going to study and inserting that content. Very, you know, counterproductive approach in part because the human mind is reflexive and because the human mind also develops historically in connection with other things. Mm. All right. He's almost done here. This is super interesting, but <laughs> I want to tell the story um, because I think this is kind of related. And it's another one of those kind of real life stories, like similar to his story with, with fish, but probably I don't know uh, a little bit, little little less 
um, scholarly. <laughs> so, so when I was uh, in high school, <laughs> I was big into you know trying to discover how how you might invent um, flying vehicles, you know, hover cars. Um, anybody that's been following this channel or myself for a while knows that as well. You know, I was really obsessed with inventing flying vehicles. So this magnetism thing, you know, that was big for me. I was like, okay, how does magnets work, right? So if we can figure this out, we can apply it to, you know, anything. Like, how can we make anything become, like, magnetic, right? And that way you can make anything hover and stuff like that, right? So I, I would delve into, you know, the theories and ideas around, like, electromagnetism, um, physics, and all this other stuff. I eventually got into quantum physics because I wanted to understand, like, how do magnets, magnets work? Like, and how, and how can we extract that and put it in other things and, like, everyday objects, right, besides just metal? And then I got, I started to see that it was extremely difficult to figure out how magnets work. Like, just that simple thing. Like, yes, obviously, there's a north and a south, and, and they, they repel if it's the same, you know, um, polarity. But why? Right. I was just trying to get into why that simple thing happens. And it, at the time, it was really, really difficult to find an, an answer, um, especially one that was like simple for like a, a, a high schooler to understand who didn't take any sort of physics class. Like it was <laughs> um, I don't even remember the exact things that they would say, but like um, I could say today, like some of it was based on like quantum physics and how like the spin of um the the sub subatomic particles within it right but spin in itself is not really what you think it is it's not actually spinning you know it's it's about the the field fluctuations um which goes into you know quantum field theory which is a whole other type of understanding so i i made this facebook post because facebook was you know actually popping at the time um <laughs> um and i was like man i'm just sitting here on the toilet thinking about like how amazing it is that I'm sitting on the toilet and I'm not actually touching, you know, the toilet seat with my butt, but technically I am like I am, but I'm not like, and part of it is because of the, the polarities of, you know, <laughs> on a microscopic le level, like this, this uh, insane amount of vacuum uh, or rather empty space, not vacuum, but like empty space between the particles, you know, of my body and the seat or the, the particles within my body and the ones within the seat. And I was, I was making these weird, <laughs> All these like, uh, you know, like connections and and like pers perspectives about this stuff, and I posted it, and people were like, this is hilarious but inspiring at the same time, um, because I think it's just important sometimes to really look into depth about things, about the way about our life and 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 just just weird things like when we when you're sitting on a toilet, really think about like the process that's going on there, <laughs> right? Like how's that process really working? Um, and I don't, I don't want to delve into it right now, but I actually do want to delve into it, but I don't, I'm not going to, <laughs> but like, just, just think about that. Like how, when you're, when you're experiencing something really delve into what you know about that experience or what you think you know about that experience and how it works on a deep level, you know, scientifically, philosophically, spiritually, even if you want to like really try to break it down. And see if you understand the individual components and how those components come together to form the overall experience, right? When you when you do these sorts of things, you can get a better understanding of things. And I, I think that's similar to uh, related here, right? If you only ever if you're only ever reading about these theories and concepts in a book, and I say that as a person who loves to read books, right? You don't you're not experiencing it yourself, right? And I used, again I used to be the type of person that says I I used to like be very contrarian because when they say oh you know you can't you can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book but then i'm like yeah maybe i can you know maybe go i'm gonna go read this and then i'm gonna go do the thing and i'll know how to do it because i've read the book <laughs> i would be that guy but you know there's a point there right i i do think that you can't learn a lot from reading like i uh, this board game i've been on this board game site and I win a lot of board games because before I play the game, I go listen to a video. I go read some strategy guides and all this other stuff. But even then, like after reading all that stuff, there's still been plenty of times where I lose or I just don't understand what the hell is happening because you have to play the game first. Or at least you have to begin playing the game. Right. And you have to play through the game before you can not before, but like in order for you to fully understand what those strategies are saying. So I do believe that it is important to read and 
all this other stuff, but you have to integrate it, right? You can't just only depend on the, the theory, the reading. You have to go, you have to have the experience in order to really understand something and to go into depth and to be able to grapple like like all the way back into you know the beginning of this, you have to grapple with that that concept yourself um, in order for you to integrate what you read more cohesively. So yeah, I really love this concept um, and this whole thing that he's talking about here. It's really fantastic stuff. So including other minds, right? So it says, um, scientific cognition does come back to itself, but not before its feeling or content is taken back into itself, is simplified into a determinateness, and has reduced itself to one aspect of its own existence and passed over into its higher truth. So Hegel's saying, look, you need both sides of this. You have to surrender in scientific cognition to the object, to the phenomenon, to what it is that you're going to be putatively knowing, understanding, interfering with, studying, arranging, ordering, or else give it up. You're not actually dealing with the thing itself. If you're going to be a philosopher of emotion, you better actually experience some emotions <laughs> and spend some time watching other people experience emotions uh, before you start your theorizing. And you right. better spend as much time as it requires in order for you to grasp that content, not just enough time to fi finish a 15-week class or pass an online test or something like that or get a certificate. The, the, the content tests you as to whether you fully understood the content. And then we arrange the content into these larger holes in which, yes, the content does assume more of its meaning. But part of the source of its meaning is coming from the very fact that it is something existing, which means that it is something that self-others. There is a process of negativity within it, not merely within us, not merely within the understanding, but also within the, the phenomena themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, we finish by uh, him saying, through this process, the simple self-surveying whole, the self-surveying whole is a self-surveying whole because human beings are part of that. Mm. Human minds are part of that. Emerges from the wealth in which its reflection seemed to be lost. Mm. So, you know, in a, in a way, it's sort of like a good news, bad news thing. Bad news is, you gotta really work and you can't skip any steps in understanding the process. Good news is, if you do that, you can develop a synoptic view of the phenomena. And I would go, so I would go further and say, if you're training yourself in this sort of approach to things, it's transferable. Hegel didn't actually figure everything out. He didn't survey every possible phenomena. His system has gaps, holes, lacuna in it. And we can use the Hegelian approach, uh, not schematically, but as something that we have internalized through our own practice. Right. This, is, this is a practice ground right here for doing that. This is the training wheels. This is the baby steps, um, and a great book too, uh, <laughs> for being able to do that. Yeah. And it's a great experience, right? Like when you experience it yourself, when you try it yourself, when you actually do it, like it's it's amazing to go through that process, you know, it's it's uh enlightening or or um like you just learn so much actually going through this process yourself. And I really am enjoying reading through this book um with Dr. Sattler here to help us out. So uh yeah, this is another really great section, uh, another really great video. Um thanks as always for for watching with me. Um, if you did, you know, check this, watch this far, please leave in the comments what you've learned from this. Um, and uh, if you have any of your own stories of, of the difference between actually theorizing or reading theory and actually going, doing it, right? Actually uh, going through the experience. I would love to hear some more stories about that. Um, and yes, I did do this on the Monday because I I was busy on, on Thursdays. <laughs> um, might be busy on this Friday too. I don't know. I like to alternate between this and the and the anarchy videos. Nice little uh, change of pace. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks as always for for watching once again, and um, have a great day. See ya. Bye bye.